Thank you. If I get the other microphone, that'd be great. Turn off the screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you're going to use this mic, okay? Do I need this? Yo, yeah, oh, you're going to need this, yeah. Okay? <laughs> you got it. Okay. One second. I I'm just getting the second microphone. Okay, so we can do this properly. Okay, so people aren't distracted. There we go. Look at that. Oh, Amazing. Wonderful. Okay. Um, oh, you're going to hold it close, okay, so people ever can hear you? You teach me, okay? I'll teach you, okay. Learn. Okay, if you can't hear, just like raise your hand, we'll, we'll yes. make it louder. We got it. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Can everybody hear me? Amazing. Speak up okay. a little more. A little more. Yeah. You want me to eat it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Rabbi Blockman, you could turn the volume up on the mic just a tad. That'd be great. Ex okay, great. So the first question is like this. Let's get right down to it, okay? You're 12 years old when the Soviets take over your side of what was then Poland. Right? I was younger. You were younger. Rabbi, I was okay. younger. May I just have one moment? Yes, before? that's how let's go. I just so hold wanted it like this, to... just like that. There we go. Okay. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about me. You've gotten a glimpse of it from there. My name is Lucia Milch. I'm Mrs. Milch. I'm here with my children, my son. And I went through, hard to say went through, a catastrophe, a tragedy for me personally, and a catastrophe for, a catastrophe for our people. I went through the Holocaust. And today, at 92, I still don't believe there are moments. I believe. And unfortunately, I have a pretty good memory for somebody 92. I wish I didn't sometimes have that memory, because the nightmares come right after the memory. But at the same time, I come to young people like yourselves in order to be able to do only one thing, and that is to tell you children that that which our enemies tell us they are going to do, if they say they mean to harm us, they mean to kill us, they do what they say. And as I have lived through that, I wouldn't want any one of you, not only Jews, but primarily I speak from my perspective, and the ancient tragedy, the ancient hatred, a very long one called anti-Semitism. The hatred is difficult to comprehend. It's even difficult to explain it. But I, as a Holocaust survivor, found it even more difficult to live it. And that is why I'm here. I wouldn't want any one of you to have to spend one day, as I did, not for a day, not for an hour, not for a week, but for years, children, for several years, we were isolated. We were extorted. We were penalized. And why? We committed a very big crime. Do you know what that crime was? If you don't, I will tell you. We were born to... little town, and the reason I gave a snippet of who I was to see my parents, my grandmother, not, this was not Fiddler on the Roof. These were living, articulate, hardworking, decent, ethical human beings. In my town, by the time two other towns were pushed into my little shtetl, we were under 10,000 human beings pushed into narrow streets and alleys. We were already pushed into those streets and alleys before, a few months before, when the order came that the Jews have to live in a certain quarter. So let's, 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 let's go back just one second. So you're born in Skalat, in West, what's Western Ukraine today. Correct. Okay, about, about an hour and a half out of Lviv, Lvov, 
and you're born there, and the Russians and the Germans split Poland in two, and Correct. the Russians take over. Correct, 1941. And in the split Poland in two. Correct. And then eventually the Germans in the in the Anschluss in in Operation Reinhardt, where they're taking Barbarossa, when they're coming through Russia, they're going to come through and they're going to take over, and they're going to come to you on July fourth, right? Correct. 1941. One. 1941. 1941. The Germans, the Germans are going to roll in in 1941, and what's the first thing that happened? The, Ger the Russians had been there. It wasn't so great, right? But when the Germans came in, what was the first thing that happened when the Germans came to power? I will come to it, but let me go back to my original statement. I am here for a purpose. It's very, very difficult for me to agree to these meetings. I very often usually say thank you, but no. It's hard. I don't sleep nights because of that. And most important, I want to be able to have, make a difference, to have a purpose, to know why you're coming to listen to me and why I'm coming to stand in front of you. I gave a few lectures, speeches, and I taught several times at Brandeis University, where my son had exhibited a uh, uh, as he said before, a exhibit of 22 Jewish women and children, human beings. The youngest one was three years old. My little sister was four years old when she was slaughtered. I'm not going to go into dif difficult things, because if I did, all of you will just perhaps stand up and walk out. It was horrific, and it's very much to the point now when I was watching the massacre in Gaza, and when those people actually decided to do what? To kill is bad enough. You don't wake up. You're dead, you're dead. But they did something else, which is what the Germans did to us. They enjoyed killing us. Does everybody hear me? Yeah. What does that sound like? Just killing? No, it is. Sadism. That is something when I saw and what I was living through now. And I said, I did not expect in my lifetime to have to speak about it and to live it again. So that is the reason why I'm here. And I forgive me for not answering the question which you said. I simply wanted to bring it to a conclusion. Well, we're, I would, mean, we're going to get there because. Would you we, kindly we, repeat? I will, but we all want to, you're going to, you're going to give us a message at the end and you're going to tell us what we need to be today and what we need to think about because we're looking to you for that direction. But in the meantime, you should. Do they I, understand me? They understand Please, you. Do you they hear get, me? They hear you and they understand. Good. But they want to, we want to get to know you a little okay. bit, okay? And your story is important. And I had the privilege of watching your movie today. And so I'm going to help just get the, the, some of the points out, okay? But the Germans came in July 4th, which is a good day to remember if you're American. July 4th, 1941. What was, the, what was your first introduction to the German occupation? Rabbi, that very first day, has so ingrained itself into my memory. It is so horrific that I don't know, and it's long, but it took only one day, the day they came. I don't know how much, I usually ask, I want you to know young people, when I lecture and I teach, I very often ask what is, who's the group? Because if there are young people, 14, 15 in high school, I have to gauge my no. answer. All adults. Okay, All and I assume that you came here to listen to me yeah. in order to learn. That first day was the beginning of something that you will find it difficult to assimilate and to live with it, but I have to tell it to you. Because I was asked what happened the very first day. I can even tell you the last day. And the last day for us was when my town was uh, declared. There were two German expressions. One is called Judenfrei, and the other one is called Judenrein. One is free of Jews, and the other one is cleansed of Jews. That was in 1943, on the second day of Shavuot. I know those dates. They are ingrained, and I have, as I said before, relatively good memory. <laughs> so what happened that first day, it happened to have been on Shabbat. 
in our little Hasidic town, it usually happened, the men, some women too elderly, but primarily every man, got up early in the morning, put on the Shabbos clothes, and whatever they had, perhaps they had a cup of chicory, which they called coffee, and maybe a piece of challah, perhaps not, but they got ready and they went to shul. They went to pray, and they were dressed in a Shabbat, Shabbat clothes. That night, the night before morning, that evening, Friday night, unto Shabbat, all of a sudden, Well, they came in all right. They came in the night before, around 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, and that was not the group yet who came to murder us. They were the people who were coming in to invade the city and to pass on and primarily to look up. These were usually one-story houses, usually even less than that, because in the windows sometimes the Russians who had their sphere of influence in our part, as you said, <clears throat> you're right, it wasn't so much divided. It was just a sphere of influence agreed upon. Mm -hmm. Between whom? Between Ribbentrop on the German side and who else? Molotov on the Russian side. I know my history, people. <laughs> I do. I do. So the um, Ukrainians, the locals were happy to see the Germans when they came in? Everybody was happy to see them. Because they knew that whatever is going to happen to them, they are going to, in many ways to do the job for them. And that is to hit, to scandalize, to, in, to inflict punishment, to humiliate us, and to kill us. And that first night, so the locals, the Ukrainians, who were your neighbors and friends, asked the Germans Let if they could get have... To it. I'm helping you. Uh -huh. we're, going, we're going. Right? So what happened? They came to look at these Germans a very, very uh, nation to look up to. And the catastrophe started in the morning when the Einsatzgruppen, you know what that is, for those of you who don't, look it up. 
I am a former teacher. I don't mean to be right. uh, By the difficult. way, you should know, when we quote the number of 6 million Jews, the truth is it's close to the 7 million Jews. Okay, there's actually a famous bishop who's devoted his entire life to uncovering all the mass graves in Ukraine and in, in, the, in Western Russia because the Einsatzgruppen, they were not killing with gas chambers. Correct. They were sent across Ukraine towards Russia and slaughtering Jews as they went. I myself personally, with, with, we found actually a, a mass grave in Ukraine that had never been marked before that the locals had taken me to. We're still uncovering the numbers, but just so you know to be educated when people are talking the number of six million, that's what goes on the, on the brochures. We're far closer to the seven million than we're at the six million because specifically of the work of the Einsatzgruppen that came across Ukraine into Russia. To give a comparison in smaller numbers to my state, to my little town, when we were all forced to get into a narrower part of our town, that was not enough. About four or five months later, the Germans gave an order to the neighboring two towns. One is called Grzymalów in Polish, Rimalev in Yiddish, Hrimalev in Ukrainian. I can tell you all three because I speak them. <laughs> and what happened is we, we swelled in our little crowded, overcrowded places to close to nine and a half, almost 9,800 Jews. What you're talking about what happened in, in, in many places that the Germans would consolidate into ghettos, which by the way is an Italian concept, the ghetto, Okay, it's not a German concept. They didn't invent it, no, but German. they will be consolidated. Italian. They'll all be told, of course, to wear the armbands, which in Ukraine in these areas will be white with a blue Magin David, okay, which is you know eerily similar to the flag that we have, and they'll be put into ghettos. So they'll bring Jews from the surrounding areas in. So Skalat is going to double in size, more than double in size, from three and a half thousand, four thousand Jews there to over nine thousand to ten thousand Jews. And of course, then the Germans, and, and most historians will agree that when the Germans started this process, they still hadn't finalized exactly what they were going to do. It was a work in progress, okay? But putting the Jews in one place for labor, of course, and then to determine what they were, and they were under control, and they had them where they needed them, was the ghetto concept, okay? But the Germans come in the first night. The Ukrainians ask your neighbors, your friends, the priests, they ask if they're allowed to have a 24-hour pogrom. That's okay. the first request they make of the Germans. And the Germans, in their kindness, agree to an only eight-hour pogrom. And which only was, men. And only men. You could only kill men. and not children. Why? But women you were, people women. would not say, what is Mrs. Wilson talking about? Why? Why only the men? It was always the same thing. To separate the men from the women. To make the the mothers, the grandmothers, the children, to be, make them more vulnerable, more uh, be able to control them better. The men were gripped, and that day, 300 men. First of all, I want to tell you, as soon as they came in, when the Einsatz group and started to march into our town, as soon as their boots hit our pavements, they started to shoot. We already were beginning to have corpses here and there and here. People didn't understand that. We came to see them. To welcome them? Hmm, not exactly. But this is what our guests did. And they started to march into the areas where we were con concentrated. When the three towns were put together, I want you to get an, uh, a little bit of an idea what it was like because it's important. Some people say they came to my house, they broke the door and they grabbed up my father, all true, and they hit him and so on. But you have to understand how carefully these things were planned and how experienced they were in absolutely grabbing us unexpectedly. This is what happened. They came and they began to go down to the area, which was so quiet, the children, that when they came from the other two towns, there was not a spot on the ground where to put a pillow, a blanket. Every family took in at least one, two, sometimes three families. And we were crowded already. No medicine, no doctors, no hospitals. Absolutely an infestation took place very quickly. And you know what that brings. If you don't, my son is a physician. He will explain it to you. And what happened was 
typhus. Typhus. Now, Lucia, let me let me came. let me just put in the hits the points on the on the chronology here. So the Germans are going to come in. There's a request by the Ukrainians, who are the neighbors and friends, if they can have a pogrom. You can imagine what happens. In fact, the beautiful towers in what, what the town is known for, the Jews are taken to the top and they're thrown off and used as target practice so they can shoot them as they're dropping down. There are images you can see of this. But what's going to happen over the next two years here is that there'll be labor camps, there'll be a Judenrat set up where the Jews have to become their own policemen. There'll be forced labor of 200, 300 men that are meant to go and work in the quarries, the local quarries, because chopping up rocks into gravel to make the roads for the tanks as the Germans are coming across to fight the Eastern Front. That was the work they were using. And of course, now bringing in all the Jews from surrounding areas are going to bring us to a point in, in 1943 at the, at the heels of many what's called actions, which is where the Germans would come in and either in, in just, just to, to wreak havoc and to show who's boss, but also to create the, uh, the, the fear factor. But what will happen in 1943 is that the Jews of Skalat will be, the majority of them will be taken to a, to a death camp called Belzic, which today is in eastern Poland, which is responsible for about 846,000 Jews that will be murdered within seven months of Belzic. It was of one of the five death camps. Okay, you guys need to know your history. There are five death camps. Auschwitz is both a death camp and a labor camp, but the death camps are Belzic, Sobibor, Chelmno, and Treblinka, Correct. where you go in only to die. And the Jews from this area and many areas in southern Poland will be taken to Belzic. And that's where the majority of the Jews of Skalat are going to meet their end. But now let's get a little personal here. Okay, so you're with your mother, your father passed away when you were very young. Yes, but my mother remarried. Your my mother remarried. Died. You're with your stepmother, your stepfather, and your stepsister. Correct. And at this stage, in 1943, when the action happens and the Jews are deported, your mother has a plan. Tell us about your mother's plan and that night, what happened when you tried to escape from Skalat. I have to end the story of the first day. I know. <laughs> and I'm not going to let go. I want to keep you here all night. But no, you know, it's gonna... I won't. They started to shoot us in the streets, people. It was horrific. Nobody expected it. Then an order came. They need 300 men because the young boys the, of the collaborators, and some of them not so young, began to walk with the Germans and run as if they were lions. This is a Jewish home. This is a Jewish home. This is not. This is not, this is a Jewish home. Why did they have to point out? Why did they have to collaborate? That was our catastrophe. If they had only, we, 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 we have a place in, at Yad Vashem for the, for the people who were the righteous Gentiles, the righteous of the, uh, of the nations, but there were those who collaborated without any reason to point out. When I finally reached the point way later on, I was left all alone. I escaped. At that point, on 1943, on the second day of Shavuot, I'm not 13. I'm 12 and a half years old. My life is finished. And what happened that day, I'll come to. However, I escaped, and I was walking the fields and the woods all by myself in such a way I have to get up. I walked like that. Why? Why was I doing that? Microphone. Why, why was I doing that? Why was I looking ahead and also in the back? Because I fully expected to be shot, either in the front, my forehead, or in the back. And I wanted to see whether he is running, that whatever he was, whether a Ukrainian militia, or the German, or a young man, for no reason but for sadistic pleasure, to grab me and to bring me over to the Germans. That was when I was all alone in the woods and in the fields, and my dear friends, my children here, I had assumed, I was convinced, that I'm the only Jew left alive in the world. Right. What else? I saw everybody was killed. They we took the 300 men to work, and with them they took our rabbi. 
That's the story I have to tell you. I don't think it's in there. It's not in there. They took our rabbi, they grabbed him. He was a tall man, a little unusual. Most of the men in our community were rather uh, shorter and stocky. He was, to me, to my childish mind, he looked like Moses. In my childish mind, he looked like one of our, like one of our leaders, like Aaron, like, like Moses. That's what I thought of him. A lovely man with a very, very long white beard and white hair. And they took him into the middle of the marketplace where there was a pump where water was coming out. And they started to hit him. You want me to tell you what the first day was? Shall I continue? Yes. They hit him terribly. They broke his legs with an iron rod. And the man begged, enough, enough. He was like a patriarch looking to me, I'm telling you. Please, enough. Someday you'll be standing in front of God, enough. Not yet. Give him more. Not yet. And he couldn't stand up because his legs were broken. They kept him, stood him up on each side, and they said, not yet. And the man was taken. I'm sorry. I'm bringing tears to some of your eyes. And I really didn't mean to. But the first day, they asked me. Do I remember the first day? Now you will remember that day. They took him to the pump. There is a pump and there was a handle. When you move the handle up and down, the water comes out of the spout, right? They took him to that spout, grabbed him. <coughs> they put his mouth under the spout and they drowned him. I am sorry. It was not everything. The 300 men were taken outside of the town to cut the branches from the trees. Why? What for? The idea was that they need the branches to camouflage their army uh, uh, cars and trucks and everything. They did it. They brought them back from out of town into our town and drove them into the area where our really huge. My son was there with me after the war, and he says, Mom, when you were talking about towers, I thought they were little tiny wooden towers and so forth. They were tall, big towers made out of stone, and on top of them were windows from where people were able to shoot down to have a little bit of a game with us, a little bit of a play. They made the young boys walk all the way up to the windows, and they said, now! And they threw them, doubt, threw them down. And those who were downstairs with the guns were shooting them in the air. You want to know the first day? I will Do you? I've told I it to you. I think they know. And the other people who were older were push, pulled down and shoved down in, into the dungeons, into the cellars. They came with a machine gun and they shot them all. How do I know all that? What, what are you talking about, Miss Mills? Where did you read it? Ah, we know. We even know those who came out from the mass graves. They were not completely killed. A day or two later, they pushed their hands out, and they came out, and they told us how they were being massacred. So those 300 men were killed, except for one young man. He was shot in his arm and in his thigh, but he survived. And what did the German do after they were massacred? One German, one with a pistol, came down and he kicked every one of the corpses. If the corpse moved, he was shot. The young boy who was wounded was kicked, but he didn't move. The German left, nighttime came, and the young boy, because was slippery, was wet and slippery, made clawed his way up into the opening of the dungeon, came slowly back to the ghetto where the women and children, as I said before, still existed, and told us exactly what happened on that day. The next day, 
They came to the, to the ghettos, and to our ghetto, and they made the mothers and the wives, and those who were relatives especially, and others, to pick up the corpses, to put them on a horse and, wag and, 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 and wagon. There were not even horses in some of them. It's the Jews who had to attack themselves, attach sure. themselves sure. to there, to the ropes, and the mothers and the sisters and the children dragged those to the Jewish cemetery where they were buried in a mass grave. That children, that people, was how we welcomed our guests, the Germans, on the first day. Well, first of all, Lucia, I want to thank you for being so vulnerable with us and, and, and sharing this with us, because this, this is not in the movie, no, all of this, not. okay? Um, let me take a cut. Let me take everyone here on a couple of points, because there are a few points in your story. I, again, I want to be here all night, but we're going to do the Go program, ahead. and Go then ahead. you're going to hang out with everybody. Everyone's coming home with you anyway at the end of the night, okay? Here. <laughs> I welcome but you. Just I a couple of points. Water. Yeah, a couple of points here. So you're, you're, the actions are going to happen. Your mother at one point is going to lie over you, pretend to be dead, and for you and your stepsister, that the Germans, if they come in, that they might think that, and you laid there for, for a very long time, were able to survive that action, ended up going a little bit outside of the center of town and hiding and building a bunker underneath, and that bunker will eventually get caught out, and you and your mother and your sister will be there, and the Germans will actually shoot into the bunker, which is incredible that they didn't With shoot grenades, you. grenades. They, they threw, threw grenades, grenades into the bunker, and... I mean, these are, these are crazy things that now are ringing very true to all of us in the room because they happened a month ago, again, with the same sadistic, evil intent. Grenades being thrown into Jews in the, Jews in the shelter and gunshots in the shelter. I mean, it, it's, if you talk about history repeating itself. But then you're going to miraculously survive that. Your mother will have thought about what the escape route will be. She will have given all of her last possessions and money to a non-Jewish family outside of the ghetto. And at this point, she says, okay, we're going. The night that they left to run, to go to this, what they thought was a safe house, turned out to be another action. Correct. And then Lucia and her mother and her sister are going to run in to the person who, who has taken all their money to save them. And I want you to just describe for us what happened right then when you came in expecting to be safe. What did, what did this person say? and what transpired between you and your mother that night? Everything, children, that I tell you, sometimes it's very difficult to believe it. But believe me, I'm telling you the truth. I wish I didn't have to tell you such truths, but that's what happened to me. I don't know what you've heard from other survivors. They tell you how they came. They, they took the father. They took the mother. I'm giving you details of the first day, and now I'm going to jump over to the very last day on the second day of Shavuot, 1943, when for me, my Holocaust, my personal Holocaust, was something that I have dreams and nightmares about it until now. And when I can no longer take it, I wake up from those nightmares in a sweat. Still today. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I identify with the hostages when they are sitting incarcerated, isolated from people, being penalized, being tortured, being beaten, I see myself in their place with them together. Can you understand that? Can you believe me that? That is how I feel about it. On that day, early in the morning, on the second day of Shavuot, my mother said, Kindalach Loma game. Children, let's go. She, in her mind, had a plan. She was going to go to somebody whom she gave the very last of her possessions. It's not that we, we had money, and we gave him money, and we had gold, we gave him gold. It was the last of the last. Everything else before we had to barter to get a bag of potatoes or some, uh, or some flour for bread. What do you think? Did we go to work? Was there an ability to get, uh, to get paid? What did we live on? We starved. We hurt. 
and yet we were saving. I will give you a story of two tablespoons of flour, if you'll remind me. It'll make you think about what our Jewish tradition is. But let's go back to the last day. My mother grabs me and my little sister by the hand, puts a shawl on herself. There is a reason for everything my mother said, everything a Jewish mother did. She tried to encourage me to leave her. Now, when I myself was raising a family, I realized what it must have been for my mother to be able to try to push me away from her. And why do you think she did it? Why do you think she was telling me, you must leave us? I don't know what you're doing. Mama, why do you do this to me? Please don't push me away. Where shall I go? I don't know, but away from here. What should I do? I don't know, but go. You're a smart girl. She tried to encourage me, and you will be able to survive. I know it, but you have to leave me first. And I couldn't. First of all, I was afraid. I didn't know where to go. I didn't have where to go. And I was petrified to leave my mother, who was my anchor. On that day, she grabs me and my little sister by the hand with a shawl on top of her. I'm telling you all this as it happened, and there was reasons for it. Why did she put on a shawl? Because she had to cover a white, as white you said, armband. A white arm bed with a blue mug and David on it. As we started to walk out of the ghetto, the question would be, how did you come out of the ghetto? How is that possible? Well, there were ghettos and there were ghettos. There was a ghetto in Warsaw where 400,000 Jewish men, women, and children were incarcerated. And there were small ghettos. We didn't have a wall. But all that the Germans had to do and say, this is where you stay. This is where you live. If we see you outside of that street and you have your insignia, your Jewish armband, you will be shot on the spot. And they did kill us. So you arrive at the house. Now there's an action in the we streets. We arrive and we hear suddenly the impossible shooting and screaming. Somebody asked me, one of the students, how can you say that you heard things? What did you hear? Oh, I tell them, I heard a lot. I heard the screaming. I heard the prayers. I heard the crying. I heard the shouting. I heard the shooting. I heard the barking and the attacking dogs. I heard it all. So as we were walking and all that hell started to break loose in the ghetto part, therefore, my mother said, look, children, on a day like today, we passed by one shul where my family happened to have been worshiping. On a day like today, children, it is Shavuot. Your grandfather, your uncles, your fathers, they would be praying today in the shul. That was our second day of Shavuot. We come to the man, we knock on the door, my mother does, she comes in because hell. In the back of the ghetto, what I just told you, hell. And the dogs were, they were attacking whom? The most vulnerable, the children or the old people, and, push, and, and, and throwing them to the ground and, and tearing at them. It was hell, if one can conceive of such a thing as hell. We come, and the man says, what are you doing here? He says, what do you mean? She says, we came, please. You told us you're going to hide me and my two little children. My stepfather, as it was said, he was taken away to a Zwangsarbeitslager, a labor to a forced camp. labor camp a while ago, and he had a horrific death. These people, a group of those, uh, uh, of those people taken, they worked as uh, forced labor uh, people, and then one day the German decided to drive them into a small shul in a different town. They poured gasoline around the, around the building, and you know the rest of it, right? They burned them alive. My mother says to him, but she says, I want you out of here now, immediately. She says, no, you can't. Please have pity on my children, because you know what's going on. Listen to what's going on. 
his wife came holding one child by her hand, but in, with, her, with her hand, and the other one in her hands. She said, what are they doing here? He, she said, I want them out of my sight immediately now. And my mother starts to cry. And she says, please, please, just 24 hours, any place. And then if you, we have to, we will leave you. And the wife says, I want you out of here. And my mother did something to me. She is talking to the man and his wife and begging pity. And then she took a look at me. I never forgot that look. She was afraid to talk, children, because he would hear. She gave me a look on her face that was wild with desperation. It was like that. Run, now run, immediately now, leave me now. She didn't say it, she didn't have to. She was telling me these things way before several times. And as she told me that, I moved backwards and she, the husband and the wife are still negotiating. She wants to take my mother by the hair and throw, and throw her out. And my mother is giving me the look, now, run now, leave me now. I go back and I see a door. I open up the door and there is a spice little room. There were sacks full of, some had potatoes, some had grain, some flour. But I look up, not as tall as this, quite a bit lower, I look up and there was a square open, and there was a attic up there, a place to hide. But how, did, how would I get there? No step ladder. And I was only 12 and a half years old. I was still very young. And as that happened, I immediately grabbed one smaller bag, whatever was in it, I don't know, I put it on top of the second bag, and I crawled up on the second bag, and immediately, with my foot, one foot in the air, and one foot, I stepped on the handle, the door handle, a heavy, before the war, iron uh, handle, and with my other hand, I grabbed the hinge. There was a hinge, a big hinge. I grabbed it with one, foot in the air, because there was no place yet for me to step. And without thinking, without having an ability to say what will happen if I don't, if I do, if I fall, I didn't care. It didn't matter, hell was going on downstairs. I tossed myself in the air, threw up, and people, I found myself in the attic. Huh? And, and your mother? I don't know. That and that's what makes it very, very difficult for me to go on living. I can only imagine, because he told me, that she simply said, I'm not going. If, you, if I do go, remember, they'll come after you. He must have pushed her out. And supposedly, was she ran with my little sister, because she didn't want to be led to the grave, and she probably was shot on the street. I was on the attic now. And you would think this is the end of the story. It's not. I'm going to stop you, Lucia, for a second. I just want you to know the story goes on, and it's more incredible. It's just, it's, it's incredible. 12 and a half year old girl who will be 13 by the time war's over is going to survive on her own now. And I just want to share just a couple of stories because I really want to just get to a, a <laughs> message they have here. Any questions so they're going to have, they got lots of, I tell you, they're all coming over tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> There are a few amazing things about your survival, your story. And again, thank you for sharing this with us. You know, I'm just going to say as an aside, we're watching a lot. Far, you guys are probably watching more videos than you should be watching. And there are terrible things like this happening right now, as we, as, as, as we know. But there's no question that if it's live and in front of us and with you, it's, it's hitting home. I'm watching, I'm watching everyone here. It's hitting home in, 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 in incredibly powerful ways. Um, and this year, more than any other year. A couple of just stories. She's going to get on her own and be wandering on her own. She's going to sneak into a camp, get, try and get back into a camp 
so she could be around Jews who are hiding. She's going to find her stepfather, who's going to say, you can't be here because they have everyone marked. You have to go. She's going to crawl under the fence to get back out of the, the ghetto camp as well. And she's going to walk on her own, on her own story after story. She's going to end up, as a 12 and a half year old girl, at a rock quarry where the, her stepfather is working. Listen to this story. I've, I've been doing, I've been going to Poland for 20 years. I know, I just made a movie, actually. It's, it's coming out soon, the war. It's an Israeli-Slovakian project about another Holocaust story. Um, so it got a little delayed in the editing process because of the war. But like, I, I, I live Holocaust stories in, 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 in a sense. And this story, is, your story is in, in just remarkable. But she's going to end up at the quarry where her stepfather is working. He's going to get a message that she's there, knowing that she's be, be, be killed immediately if she gets discovered. He's going to climb to the top of the rocks. He's going to bang his pickaxe on the rocks, and he's going to start singing, singing in Yiddish. He's going to sing a song in Yiddish, but the words to the song are to Lucia saying, you have to go. They will kill you here. Don't wait for us. Go on your own. You're the only hope of survival. You have to go and don't turn back. He sing. I mean, I almost want you to sing the song for us. I mean, I don't know what it sounded like, but imagine that song being sung by a father, never seeing the daughter again, telling her to go, and she gets the message. She will spend the remainder of the war until the Soviets liberate, pretending to be a Ukrainian peasant, saying that Jesus should have a long life and learning all the tricks of the trade. She'll almost get caught a number of times, not the least of which is saying, oy vey, in her sleep. Exactly. Right? You should have known better. How can you, how can you sleep talk like that, like I, a Jew? The guilt was unbelievable. I couldn't <laughs> right. believe it. Right. My mother told me never to say a word of Yiddish. Never admit who you are, no matter what they do to you. But I must have had a nightmare. And in my nightmare, I said, oy vey. And the woman in the morning said, what were you blabbling? You were thinking, you were singing, you were saying something. I had an awful nightmare. My mother telling me, go, and I don't know where to go. Go ahead. So this beautiful Jewish girl from Skalat ends up a Ukrainian peasant farm girl and able to survive that way till the Soviets move across and, 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 and defeat the German army. It's not the end of the war. It's just the Soviets... You know, exactly. advancing on Germany. It's not the end of the war, but it was liberation. And, of course, the story is going to go, now you're alone, you're an orphan, and you have a cousin that you find out about, and that you're able to be reunited, you end up in Lodge, right? And then you need to go to an orphanage, and your friend, you heard of an orphanage. Yes. And this is, I'm going to add one more piece to this story, okay, which is remarkable. And, and many people don't know this. After the war, when Jews went home, and you went home, and you went back to Scala, and you were recognized there, and of course none of your family had survived, and there were people who remembered you, and brought you back to nurse you back to health there, and the doctor remembered you, right. and you're eventually able to find your cousin, go to lunch, and eventually able to have yourself, as a, you know, you're a 13-year-old girl traveling across Poland on your own to, exactly. to, a, to an orphanage that you heard about, but being able to on find it. Wagon and they didn't move, I went to another train wagon. I mean, I am, I, I'm just Can saying... Can you imagine that? My wife and I, are, are, our twins just turned 14. You know, like the thought of, of, of them traversing war-torn Europe on their own, surviving on their own with nothing. Like, this is the resourcefulness is incredible, of course. But sh you're eventually going to get to an orphanage. And people don't know how vicious the, the fascists and the anti-Semites were after the war. A famous massacre, a pogrom in Kilcha in Poland, is going, to, is going to murder hundreds of Jews. And Jews exactly. are looking for their family. And Jews are going to go home to their house, and there'll be a Ukrainian or a Pole living in it, and they'll kill the Jew because they want to keep the house. These stories are far, far, far too numerous just to overlook. But in this particular story, and I, I know a lot of stories, so this next part is something that I was blown away well, by. Just to put in context, yeah. so at this point, over 100 members of our family on mom's side have died. Mom survived with two first cousins. Under. Consolidated in three towns. Your mom is one of 176 survivors. Right. And has gone and has gathered all the stories and published. Amazing. That. 176 or maybe 77. The dispute is about one person. That includes those in the ghetto who escaped, like myself, in different ways. 
jumped from the trains, you know, those which were taking them to a place sure. like Belgium, or uh, for those who were designated to go to Auschwitz, uh, Auschwitz and Birkenau, you know that, and Treblinka, I don't sure. have to tell you. But when I, when I was all by myself, what happened is that evening, I, uh, that day I came up to the attic and there was nothing. What a, just a lot of dust and straw and more dust, about that much, a foot of dust and straw, and I don't know what to do, but I realized what necessity will make you think and do. I was still very young, but I must have been, you know, streetwise, if I may use that word. The Germans have taught me that. I had to. Uh, we're going to run out of time here for this, this gathering. I think what the rabbi is asking, and in the documentary, a lot of this is covered in the book that you put together, Death of a Shekel, and other things that we produce. But I think, Rabbi, you're asking, post this trauma, right. post the liquidation of the ghetto, post the liberation, shall we call it that, of the Soviet Union coming back in, suddenly you're an orphan and you, you go back to Scotland, there's nothing there. And your question is, post that with the orphanages and then right. almost going to Israel, part of the Zionist group and eventually right. coming to the United States. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just share one, one amazing story. This, was, this blew me away, absolutely blew me away. So the, the orphanage, the orphanage that she's in, all of a sudden, there's a chaos because the fascist anti-Semite groups had bombed, thrown grenades into a neighboring orphanage. Exactly. You're a talking Jewish, there are children, a Jewish, a Jewish orphanage, orphanage, and right. they had killed all the orphans. And this is post-war. In 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 in, no, in Belgium. No, it was in no, David. It was not in Lodz. It was in in in. It in, was in Bielestok, and then it was. Uh, Rapki Vielki. I remember the names of the towns, David. <laughs> so, I know it. So now here's what's going to happen. Ready? The Zionist groups that are there, that are after the war, putting together, of course, all the all the help and 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 uh, and machinery to save the Jews and get Jews to to, where they, to a safe place, are going to hear about the bombings. They realize that this orphanage is next. They're going to come with trucks and round them up and throw all the kids into the trucks and the staff of the orphanage. And they basically have to drive across the border. Now, this is the incredible, I, I want to research this plot of what happened, but you have to hear this one point. It's absolutely incredible. I've never heard such an amazing thing. They had to get across the border. The, the anti-Semites, all right, say. it's amazing. And the anti-Semites and the fascists are waiting for them. You can't have a bunch of Jewish kids who are, who are there. They're going to get caught out. There's no question. So you have to come up with a ruse. So their ruse was that, that they were going them? to be, they're going to be Greek refugees crossing the border. Why Greek? Really? I mean, why not uh, Romanian? Why not Uzbekistani? Yeah. There was a reason. Because with the Polish government in exile located in London. I know it all. I can write the history. I translated the letters from Polish into English, which were sent by these couriers. And it was sent to me from Sweden. I know it all, and you, I worked you, on you it. You are the history. <laughs> you, you're the living history. It, maybe, maybe. So, so they're going to get across the border and listen to this ruse. They're going to pretend to be Greek refugees because they can, home. because there are Greeks that are in Auschwitz, of course. And by the way, you should know, the Greeks were the ones who were put on the Zunderkommand, the ones who worked the gas chambers, because exactly. they didn't speak Yiddish or Polish or any of the normal languages, so they couldn't be part of an underground. They couldn't, they couldn't so they had them there. So the, of, of the famous people working in the gas chambers were, the, at the end of the war, mostly Greek. They're going to be pretending to be Greek refugees. Here's the most amazing thing. <laughs> now, they need to know that they can stay, but no one speaks Greek. So they decide, but there's we one. We didn't know Greek. <laughs> but there's we one. We were thing. Greeks and we didn't know Greek. You gotta listen. To this. They have to get across the border, and they've got Poles and Ukrainians. And the one thing the Poles and Ukrainians do not speak <laughs> is Hebrew. <laughs> so they're gonna speak Hebrew to each other, but pretending it's. Wait, 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 guys, wait, 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 w
Okay, now, but here's the best part. You have an orphanage of Yiddish-speaking Ukrainian kids who don't speak a word of Hebrew. Hebrew wasn't a spoken language. The Zionist youth movements would learn Hebrew, but not the shtetlach, kindelach, the maidel from the shtetl. She didn't speak any Hebrew. So they have this problem. They're going to speak Hebrew, pretending it's Greek. They're going to say these kids are Greek kids, but the kids don't speak Hebrew even. So what do they do? So the most amazing thing I've heard ever, like in the Holocaust story, is that they tell the kids, they all know how to say brachot, blessings. So he says, just say all the blessings that you know, like you're having a conversation. Say, Oh, yeah, brachot. Oh, yeah, Marebi, there was Hamotzi Lechem in the arts. And imagine the scene of these kids. This is brilliant. Like, imagine the scene of these kids saying blessings that they know from their home to pass as Greek kids. They get across, they make it across the border. I mean, if you don't believe in God after that one, you're like, they make it across the border with that, right? And, uh, and of course, I'm going to just fast forward. And here we are in Greenwich Village with you, okay? But, but. <laughs> I, wa I want to stay here all night. I know everyone does, but, but I, if I can ask you, Lucia, I, I, we're bringing you back. You want to give a class here like once a month to come in? Like, can we do this? I yeah, like think, history? I don't want, I don't think they want to oh, come and trust me, to they me. want. They want no. to come. Trust me, they want to come. Okay? I bring, trust me, they want I to bring come. tears to your eyes, and they yet you want to come? Oh, yeah. 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 Shh. David, yeah. Loud, say loud. Eventually, mom ended up at a displaced persons camp in, outside of Munich. A lot of Jews ended up in the DC camps. There's a whole story to that. But at some point, they had to get out of Germany. They had to get out of Europe. And the goal was, in the case of mom, and the Zionist group that had been organized, was to get to Israel. And you couldn't get to Israel from a landlocked country. You had to get to a country that was on the border. was the second youngest of that group. The others were 16, 17, uh, some were 19 already. Children, they referred, we want you to be prepared. You will make a little bundle for yourself, only that which you can carry on your back. You will not be permitted to drop it. So take only as little as you can, and you will carry it with you. So finally, you knew. This is, this is the Haggadah. It's going on and on and on. Ah, we will be crossing the mountains, the Alps, in the middle of December when there is time for a snowfall. Why? Because to cover our tracks so that others who will come after us will be able to do the same thing. And we had a plan. A boy and a girl, a boy and a girl, a boy and a girl, one boy behind and I, another boy in front of me and a girl. And as misfortune will have it, I step with one foot and we are going. This is the third range. We said if this one we make it, we will make it alive. There was one more on the fourth one. We almost going to say we cannot do it and we were trained. We are not allowed to say we cannot do it. We are not allowed to cry. We are not allowed to do anything like that. Just walk and walk. I put my foot down, and I put down the second foot, and it goes in into the snow above my knee. I can't retrieve it. There was a hole, maybe the edge of a mountain. We didn't see it. It was snow. There was a signal. We had signals. The group stopped on a dime. Two other boys came over, plus the one in back of me, was supposed to help me, and the three of them retrieved my foot out of the snow and tested where there was another piece of solid, uh, solid mountain for me to put the other foot down, and we went on. That is how I got to Italy, my dear friends. Doesn't everybody get there the same way? <laughs> okay. Here's what we're going to do right now, Lucia. You're, you're amazing, and, and you know, 
the crazy thing is, is that we're looking at a room here of people whose children will likely never meet a survivor. Probably, okay? probably not. And, and, and you are... It's only two more friends left my age, that's all. And, and that's why it's packed here tonight. And they cannot talk. They tell me we would not be able to... You're unbelievable. To you're unbelievable. I'm, I'm, I'm taking that for dinner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But, but here, here's, here's what I'm going to ask. You, you, you know what we're going through right now. Yes, I do. And, and That's why I'm here. I know, I know. And, and it's being, you know, we say it's the worst pogrom since the Holocaust. And it's a new sort of the old anti-Semitism, which is Absolutely. now taking over our universities, Absolutely. the streets of New York. If you walk up and down the street, all you see are the Rabbi, posters. that's why I am here. I know, but all you see up and down 13th Street are the posters that were already ripped down within minutes of being put up of kidnapped children because that's so offensive to the to people who are deeply, deeply rooted in Jew hatred and anti-Semitism. Uh, I'm going to ask you if you can. I'll, I'll help you, but everyone in the room, I, 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 we, need, we need a message of chizuk from you. Oh of strength through. We need, we need to hear from you. You have to tell us what you want from us. You have to guide it. You're the tour guide now leading us over the Alps. And we're the ones with our feet stuck in the snow who don't know how to walk and don't know how to move. But I'm going to ask you, I'll, I'll, well, I'll, if you could stand up so everyone can see you. And you've got to tell us what to do. We're, you're, you're, we brought you here because we're lost. We need your guidance and your wisdom. We're dealing with traumas and realities that we never thought we would deal with, and the world is in now a different place. This is after Kristallnacht for us. October 7th was our Kristallnacht, and our world and the world we raise our children in will not be the same world as it was on a, before that. So I'm look, we're looking to you, Lucia, to, to guide us and to give us some words of, of hope, if you could. Can I ask you? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Keep the microphone up. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to know people, wonderful people, who came to listen to an old lady of terrible stories. And yet you came, and some of you say that if I had a chance to speak again, some of you may even come again. I, I, I'm shocked. I, I, I am surprised. I am pleased. I am speechless because of what's happening now in Israel. But the question that I was just asked I have to face that question. What do I have to finally say? Another question, by the way, which was asked by a Catholic teacher who brought a group of 70 students to me. And in his way, his question was, I know where it comes from. His question was, Mrs. Milch, one question of you only. I said, yes. Can you forgive? From his theology, I know where it comes. You forgive, you give an absolution, correct, and you are fine. And I have an answer to that, and it's not original. Sometimes there were two at one time people, mm -hmm. this is not the question of, uh, not with reference to what I have to leave with you, but the question was, can you forgive? Two people were in the hospital, it's real, in Germany after the war, a survivor and a German. And they were very sick, and the German who was so sick turned to the survivor in his bed, and he says, I want to ask you something. Yes, what is it? He said, I cannot, I know I'm dying, and I cannot die with the feeling that I didn't ask you forgiveness. I didn't ask you to please forgive me. Do you want me to say why? He says, I don't need it. I don't need it. He says, I was a German with the SS. I asked for forgiveness. And what did the man say to him? He said, if I knew that you were in front of my father and my mother and my little brothers and sisters and you killed them, I would want to grab you and take you before a judge and a jury. That is my tradition if you ask me to forgive you. For myself, perhaps I could think about it. For those that were killed and you were part of it, I have no right I cannot forgive you that. That is not within my power. That is on the question of forgiveness. The question of what I want to leave with you is also in a similar way. It's not easy to give you an answer like that, my dear people. 
I'm going to quote Primo Levi. Does anybody or everybody know who Primo Levi? He was an Italian Jew, a chemist by profession. And he, like Ili Wiesel, most of you maybe read Night or not, you know who Ili Wiesel is and, uh, uh, and Samuel Pissar, who happened to be, Samuel Pissar is the stepfather of the, our president, our present uh, Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, the important thing, all three by coincidence are leaving Auschwitz when they are no more than 16 years old. They are liberated. And Primo Levi says, I remember when I was pressing myself, it happened to me too, when an action came and I knew that they're going to pick an X number of Jews into the gas chamber that day, that day, I went and I pressed myself into the wall. I did this when I was walking out from the peasant, and there was a moon and, the, uh, and, and clouds, and when the moon was under the clouds, they couldn't see. It was late at night, dark, no electricity, nothing during the war, and in order not for somebody to spot me, I, I went like that. I walked like that, so that they will not see movement of a human being. That is how I walked and finally got myself like a dog. I started to, under the fence, I started to dig like a dog. It dug up, and I dug up a big enough hole that I was able to cross under it. That's what you were referring right. to, how I got into the camp. So what do I leave you with? Primo Levi says, they took away my shoes. They took away my clothes. They took away my hair. They took away my name. My name is printed here, right? He said they took everything away from me, except I was trying to hold on to one thing, to the humanity in me. If there was an ounce of humanity still left in those days, that I will not let them take away from me. I want to tell you, children, even those talented writers and people and educated and absolutely humanity was on their mind even in the last moments. Even they said, we don't know where the answers are. I do have one answer. They didn't, I'm smarter than they, don't you see? <laughs> what, I do have an answer. What we must do is absolutely the following. Never, never, ever do nothing. Doing nothing is not acceptable to me because I know and I saw what it led to. That was why I'm here today, children. I'm not so smart, I'm not the brain. I am an ordinary Jewish woman, a mother, and so forth, but I have read enough literature. I have read history, it was my major in college, by the way. I didn't go to school for nine years at all, but eventually I made it. To do nothing is not what I'm leaving you with. Do everything, anything that you can. Speak to your representatives. Go and put up more uh, 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 pamphlets and confront, not at your danger, God forbid, I don't want that, but doing nothing is extremely dangerous. That is what I want to leave them with, and that is why I am here tonight. I do my little bit, and if I reached you, not to scare you, not to make you feel terrible, but to teach you, and if that will not help, to warn you that those who say they want to come and destroy us, they mean it, and they eventually come and do it. Therefore, doing nothing is the worst that you can do. Do what you can, and that will be, an our, it will be our salvation. We will survive. A lot of other ancient countries were, existed, Babylon and the others, they are no longer here. We were weak. We have a history of terrible, terrible tragedies, expulsions, killings, everything, but we are here. Like the partisan song says in Zemadu, we are here, and I guarantee you we will remain here, but we have to do something about it and not be quiet, not be afraid, not be indifferent, not have to run to work or to do this or to buy a pair of shoes. That is also important, but doing nothing is not what I'm leaving you with.
do the best that you can. If you heard me, if it made sense to you, if it touched you, pass it on. Pass it on. That is my answer, sir. Lucia, we, you are. Let's give it up. Let's give it up. Let's give it up.